Today, you are going to get a front row seat to the incredible Springbok journey of 1995 Rugby World Cup champion Naka Drotsky. Naka, welcome to Front Row Rugby. Peter, thank you and thank you for the invite. It's, it's nice to be here. Before we begin our conversation, let's take a look at today's trivia question. In 1994, Joel Stransky equaled the Springbok individual points record of 22 in one test. Who were the opponents that day? Now, if you know the answer to the question, you can put it in the comment section down below. And we'll also find out if Narka knows the answer, but we'll do that at the end of our conversation. Narka, first question, how did Alan Erasmus become Narka? You know, it's actually a funny story. Um, when I grew up, I grew up in, in Siena College, a small little town in the eastern Free State, about 200 guys from, from Bloemfontein. And I grew up on a farm and, you know, every morning we were playing... Uh, like rugby and soccer and whatever, you know, with the with the with the farm boys there on the farm, and they started calling me uh, Sinatla, uh, which is which is meaning big guy. But then my my cousins were also playing with me, and and they couldn't pronounce it, so they tried to pronounce Sinatla, and it came out as as Naka. And uh, when I when I got to primary school, um, you know, everybody called me Alan, but um, I had two cousins in my class and. They started to call him, calling me Naka, and, and it stuck. Talk to me about how you were feeling ahead of your test debut against Argentina in 1993. Now, I think every Springbok will tell you that um, your first test is it's probably the most special one that you ever play. Um, I was in, at the start of 93, I was still playing flank for, for the Free State. And in those days, you couldn't lift in the, in the lineouts and... Uh, Martins Leroux, our coach, said to me, uh, you know, I, I can't pick two short loose forwards. And Theo Oosthuizen was the captain. So, you know, I can't play you anymore. And he said to me, if, if you want to make it, you, you have to switch to hooker. So I actually switched to hooker earlier in 93. And then when we played the Sharks in Durban, Ian McIntosh came to came to me and, and say, listen, we want to take you on the end of the year tour. So... That was amazing when when we got on the tour. John Allen was for the first choice. They struggled in the first test. In in the second test, um, all of a sudden, I, I played my first test, which was absolutely amazing. I've been told by a lot of players that have appeared on Front Row Rugby that Argentina is the best country to tour. Peter Miller, for example, told me that the stakes are great and the girls are very pretty. What do you say? No, I think that's a good summary. Awesome stakes and, and beautiful girls. <laughs> I agree with, with Peter, but also very, very friendly people and, and very passionate people. Um, you know, the rugby there is very, very hard. We played in that um, Battle of Tucumán, which was quite interesting. It's the first time ever I saw stuff happening like like what happened, you know, that day. Um, and I was 22 years old, you know, and I, I was... I was in the touring squad with with some of a, a lot of legends, you know, guys. When I was in high school, they were already playing, like James Small, Theon Strauss. Um, you know, those guys were my heroes. And all of a sudden, when we toured and, and I toured with them, so awesome experience. And then you were actually out of the picture until the 1995 Rugby World Cup. What actually happened? Well, we my first test was end of uh, November. 1993. In 1994, uh, England came to tour South Africa and we played them, Free State played them in Bloemfontein uh, in about 15, 20 minutes into the game. I dislocated my, my right shoulder. So I had to, to go in for an operation. Um, I was six to eight weeks in, in uh, rehab. And two games later in the Caddy Cup, I also dislocated my left shoulder. So 1994 was was probably a year to forget. I had two shoulder operations. Um, it was a tough year. But, you know, that, that keeps you going. And, and uh, I, I've learned a lot from that, to be patient. And in 95, I was all fit and ready to go. There were a lot of pre-tournament training camps that took place. Were you part of that? Yes, actually, I was there at, at the Wanderers. Um, that those were were tough days, you know. Kitch was very, very disciplined, and he also he always said that you know 
you, you might not be the best team at the World Cup, but I promise you, you will be the fittest team at the World Cup. And uh, he kept his promise because we were training. I've never trained that hard in my life um, uh, for those probably eight to ten weeks before the before the World Cup started. So, how disappointed were you to miss out on that initial World Cup squad? I was disappointed, um, you know. But that's that's life, and that's rugby. Um, you know, I thought I I, I would have made it, um, but then Kitch had uh, other ideas and. You know, just to came back in the end uh, because of um, of James Dalton, uh, you know, who wasn't allowed to play anymore, uh, was unbelievable. So I, w- I was just so um, so happy to be part of it at the end. Initially, I was very, very disappointed. Your support from the bench became quite legendary with the television cameras uh, fixed on you with your various celebrations and the encouragement. Talk to me about the emotions that you were experiencing that day. Yeah, all of us, you know, we were there on the bench. Um, it's quite frustrating when you're on the bench because you, you can't really do anything and you're also psyched up and, and hyped up and you, you just want to go on the field, but you can't. Um, so watching that first and second half, going into that game, you know, we believed we have a chance, but we were never the favourites. There's no way, with um, especially with Jono Lomo, who came from nowhere and was an absolute freak, you know. And so we we believed in the back of our heads that we that we could win, but we we, need, we didn't really think that it, it can happen. And then after full time, when it was still nine all, you know, the sort of okay, but now we really have a chance. And you know that part where Joel kicked that um, drop goal, we were just going mad and. You know, the camera was was on me. I never knew that. But um, that was an awesome experience. I think I, I've grabbed Johan Rue there and we were just going mad. So then we thought, OK, listen, one minute to go, one or two minutes, we can become the world champions. So you played one test match in that 1995 Rugby World Cup. That was against Western Samoa on the 10th of June, 1995. You also played a test match on the 10th of June, 1997 against Tonga. But in between, you only played one test for the Springboks. That was against Australia in the Tri-Nations in 1996. How frustrating was that period for you? That was very frustrating. You know, you, you get you get new coaches and you get those coaches each have their own idea. So... If a coach rates you, he will pick you. And obviously, if he, if he doesn't rate you, he won't pick you. Um, in 1996, was Andre Markrov, um, you know, was a coach. He believed um, he needed to pick like a bigger hooker. I, I remember he, he brought in Hendrik Tromp, which was also an awesome player. But it's frustrating, um, you know, if you be, you've been there and all of a sudden you get a coach who who doesn't really rate you. Um, interestingly enough, in, in 1999, um, Andre Markrov became the catch coach. And we got al- along really, really well. And, you know, in the end, we had a, ro- a lot of respect for each other. But 96, um, I think it was, was on Australian tour, I came on once from the bench. Um, the other thing about those days, you must remember... You could only go onto the field when there's an injury. Uh, there were there weren't such a thing as a bomb squat or subs. Um, the guy needs to be injured before you can replace him. So in those days, the front rows play, played eighty minutes. Um, there was no such thing as a as a as a sub or a or the bomb squat or, or whatever. But um, I would say ninety six was probably also like 94, a really frustrating year for me. But in 1997, you were the first choice hooker. We lost a series against the British and Irish Lions early in the year. Why did we lose that series? Well, in my opinion, you know, it's easy to identify that. And um, I think we're in the same boat now at the World Cup. Um, We lost the first test against the British Lions in Cape Town. Uh, I think we scored two tries to one. Um, our kicking wasn't great, but it wasn't a problem that day. Um, then in the second test in Durban, uh, which was actually, we needed to win that to stay in the competition. 
We scored three tries. Um, they scored five penalties and a drop goal, uh, and they won the game. And we missed um, all our opportunities at, at goal. We, we only had three converted tries, and, and we lost the game 18-15. So, you know, that just shows you, you can't, in, the, in those tight series, it's like a British and Irish Lions team or a World Cup quarterfinal, semifinal, you need to have a kicker. You know, that's where it starts and that's where it ends. Um, so that was devastating, especially dominating that, that whole game for 80 minutes in Durban, where all of a sudden we lost the series in the second test. We'll stay in 1997 for now. In the Tri-Nations that year, we hammered Australia at Loftus. We also got a bit of a hiding from New Zealand uh, in Christchurch. So a mixed bag of results. How would you describe that Tri-Nations? Yeah, I remember the the first game we played um, New Zealand in Joburg, and we actually had an awesome game. We were leading, and I re- I remember I think it was Frank Bunce who scored two tries in that game, but we were really competing, and we we lost that game. I think it was something like thirty five, thirty two. Um, so that was actually actually a good game. Um, I think we were in New Zealand, like you say. I'm not. I can't remember whether that was the, the year when Andre Fenter get, got the, the red card for stamping on on Sean Fitzpatrick. But the tour wasn't good. Um, you know, we were under a lot of pressure. We didn't perform well, and then all of a sudden we came back and with um, Carlo Duplessis' last days in at Loftus, we really played well and we won the. Uh, the Aussies by, I think, 35 points. Um, so it was a it was a mixed up season, the 97 Tri Nations. And what did you make of Carl Duplessis as a coach? No, I, I liked Carl. Um, I think he's a good coach. He's technically he's very good. Um, I think they should have maybe gave him a little bit more time. Like I've said, if we had a kicker in the second um, test, you know, we would have won. For for example, they they brought in Yanni de Beer for the third test, and we won that test against the Lions by about fifteen to twenty points. Um, so I think the biggest mistake he made is not picking Yanni de Beer because I was playing with Yanni at the Cheetahs in that year, and you know he was on really good form, but they didn't pick him and. Um, I can understand that. Uh, Henry, uh, Henry Hannibal was an awesome player. But you can't win those pressure matches without uh, a, a good kicker. And um, like I say, if, if, if Yanni probably played, we would have won the series against the British Lions and Coral would never have been fired. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, why not consider becoming a patron? It's my dream, guys, to do this full time. And with a small financial contribution, you can help me realize that dream. The link and the QR code is appearing on your screen right now, and I'll also put it down in the description area for you to go and click on at a later stage if you would like to do so. And by becoming a patron, I promise there will be great benefits for members. Now let's get back to the interview. You largely played second fiddle again in 1998, but in 1999 you were again the main man in the number two jersey. We beat Italy convincingly at home, including a 101-0 victory in Durban. But then we went to Wales, which was quite a strange scenario because it was our season, but we went over there. It was the opening of the Millennium Stadium, as I recall, and we lost to Wales for the first time. But I've heard that there were some distractions before the test match. Some of the guys that have been here have told me that Rian Oberholzer was in interfering with the team on the eve of the test match. What can you tell me? Yeah, you're correct. It was it was the first game of the Millennium Stadium. That's why they invited us and we flew over there. And um, yes, I, I can remember that very, you know, very clear. We were we were in Wales. Um, Rian arrived, I think, on the Tuesday and he had a meeting with us and what he basically told us is, listen, we we need to pick a certain percentage of this team needs to be transformation players. And the guys were arguing with him and asked him, listen, would they be there on merit? Or And he said, 
I think he handled that meeting terribly. Um, the feeling we got when we walked out there is, listen, this is this might be your last test. And everybody was looking and seeing what other transformation players is playing in your position in South Africa because we we made the sum. He, he said, I think he mentioned seven or eight in the starting lineup. Um, now, that was on a Tuesday. On the Thursday, we had a meeting with uh, Nick Mallett, the coach, and, and the team were really, really upset. And, and there was a big, big dis destruction going into that game. I, I can remember still on a Friday night, um, you know, at, at dinner, the guys were talking about it. And we actually wanted to strike in that game, um, you know, and we decided against it. So, I think the, the timing of Rian Oberos and the way that the translated the message to us was was not good at all and then you could say it almost got worse because later that year we suffered a 28 nil defeat against the all blacks in new zealand away from home in the tri nations how much of a low point was that 28 nil defeat that was a really low low point defeat but um i think what played a big a huge role there was uh, gary teichman got injured um uh, and then you know, a lot of the players, we had, we had huge respect for, for Gary. Um, as a captain, he was awesome uh, in us, you know, breaking that uh, or equaling that world record of 18 tests in a row. In a row was 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 97 um, and 98. And Gary was captain in all of those tests. So when we had to go on tour, Gary was injured, but he was, he was also going on tour. But then a lot of... A lot of us started hearing rumors that, um, you know, Nick wants to drop Gary for Bobby Skinstad. And the players wasn't, wasn't happy at all. I mean, it, it worked really well in 98 in the Tri Nations when Bobby was on the bench coming up, you know, as a super sub in the last 20, 30 minutes. And, you know, I, I thought it was just a rumor, but then all of a sudden it happened. Um, you know, and you, you could see the relationship between Nick and, and Gary wasn't great. Um, but that, that played a huge role, all the rumours. And Gary was on the tour, but he wasn't captain. He was injured. Um, so we had, a, we had a terrible tour uh, in in '99. What was the atmosphere like in the Springbok camp going into that 1999 Rugby World Cup? Well, we all... Met up at, um, we had our pre-season camp in Plettenberg Bay. Um, Joost was, was the, the new captain. Uh, I thought we prepared really, really well. But going into the World Cup, um, you know, we everybody thought we had no chance. Um, and you could see there was a little bit of lack of confidence uh, after the Tri-Nations. The guys knew, listen, we are underdogs, but we, we trained really, really hard in plate. And um, when we got to the World Cup, uh, we were based in Edinburgh in, in Scotland. And I think we played Scotland that year first in that World Cup as well. And, and we had a great win. And then the conference built. Um, and our biggest game of the season was England in the quarterfinal in Paris. Uh, and England was, was I think they was their favourite team in, in that World Cup. Uh, you know, they, they had uh, all the Martin Johnsons and those guys who, who in the end came, came through in 2003. They were actually on their peak. Um, you know, and the rest, the Yanni De Beer five drop goals. Uh, that game was just awesome. I remember U.S. van der Vestes and speaking in a radio interview at the time saying that the guys didn't really feel as if they were at a Rugby World Cup while they were in Scotland. Would you go along with that? I, I, I wouldn't say that was my experience. Um, I mean, if you're at a World Cup, all you see is you, you see a lot of tourists. Every pub, every place you go, there's, there's hundreds of tourists. When, when you put on the TV, you know, it's a World Cup. Um, maybe because, you know, Edinburgh was a little bit out of, you know, away from because the, the World Cup was in France and England. And most of the stuff stuff happened in, in, in Cardiff, in uh, London and in Paris. Um, so where we were based was a little bit 
you know, away from from where everything happened. But still, Edinburgh is an awesome, awesome town. And I think it's maybe it's an advantage for us because we, we weren't favourites and we were staying away from the big traffic. So in the end, I, th I thought it helped us. That quarterfinal in Paris against England, Yanni kicking five drop goals. It was a world record. It still is uh, to this day. How memorable was it to be a part of that match? No, that was awesome. Um, you know, I've played with Yanni since we were 19 years old when we met at University of Bloemfontein, Kofsis. Um, He was coming from, from uh, Valcom. I was coming from Siena Col. And we started playing for the Varsity Under-19 team, the Varsity Under-20 team, Free State Under-20, and later for, for Free State. We, so we were actually big mates. And um, the plan was never, there, there was never a plan that Yanni should drop goal. Uh, with the first drop, drop goal, I think he was cut off when he wanted to pass outside. And he stepped back. And in, in that situation, basically, all you can do is, is drop goal. And he slotted that one. And when the second one went over, you know, it started to become a game plan. You know, we got together and said, listen, what we're going to do now is uh, let's keep away the chases. Let's set up the ball once or twice with the forwards, Yanni in the pocket, and get the drop goal. And uh, in that game, you know, obviously Yanni with, with his boots, but also... Our forwards were really, really good in that game because England have the strongest back in, in the World Cup. And we really stood up that game. We dominated, uh, you know, in the front and our defence was awesome. And of course, Yanni's five drop goals is 15 points. And then how disappointing was it to lose to the Wallabies in the semi-finals the way we did? No, that was devastating. Um, you know, because of the fact, uh, a, a big big uh, decision for us was when we lost Brendan Fenter. Uh, he was cited for stamping and he, and he got a, a red card. I think it was against, uh, I can't remember, Spain or something. But, you know, the game against Australia, um, Timmy Aaron was brilliant. And if we had Brendan there, because Brendan's defence is, is his strong point. So we were going into that game and Timmy Oren was one of the best players in the world. But we played well and, you know, all of a sudden when the last whistle, minute before the last whistle, Yanni had a penalty to keep us tight and he slotted that penalty and all of a sudden we had to play extra time. And just the way we lost with Larkham, you know, kicking his, his only drop goal in his life, and the way the, the bounce ball on the ground, the ball bounce on the ground was was devastated. Um, and also, I think when it really it 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 says was after the game, Nick said, "Okay, listen, guys, let's take it. We would have anyway. We don't have the informed team to beat the All Blacks in the final." And we went to the hotel and the next day when we watched the game, all of a sudden the All Blacks was was out of it. So. It's it's amazing how close you can get to something, you know. But um, if we have if we have, if we have beaten Australia, you know, we 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 would have beaten France easily in the final. And then after that was the third fourth place playoff against the All Blacks, as you mentioned. We won that. It was also your final Test match for the Springboks. When you look back, are you happy with the way it all panned out, or do you have any regrets? No, I don't have any regrets. Um, you know, obviously. Uh, I, w I would have liked, you know, to play in an era where, you know, front rowers, um, the one, the one plays forty-five, the other way, other thirty-five. You know, I would, have, I would have loved to, if, if that was the era I played in, because then you would have played every week. You would have got yourself a chance to to play you into the starting lineup. Um, but other than that, injuries, you know, you can't. You can't do anything about injuries, um, so I have no regrets now. So who was your toughest opponent? Well, toughest opponent, um, I would say Keith Wood. Um, I rate that Keith Wood as, as the best hooker that I've, that I've ever played against. 
obviously you, you get guys like Sean Fitzpatrick, uh, who is a really great captain, uh, a great player. But um, you know, in my in my opinion, talent wise and scrumming wise and 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 all of those, uh, Keith Wood was was really really a tough tough customer. And when you look around the rugby landscape today in the modern era, is there a particular player that stands out for you that you admire? Well, I think there's a few. Um, I think Malcolm Malcolm Marks is uh, he brought a new a new sort of dimension to playing hooker. Um, he's a he's a really big loss for us in the World Cup. Um, he's one of those key players, you know, where when you lose him, you know, you, you're in trouble. Especially with, you, you've got a four loose forward playing on the ground, stealing balls. Um, so he's a, he's a massive loss uh, to us. So I would say um, Malcolm Marks. Um, I would also say Cheslin Corby is one of the best players I've ever seen in my life. Um so the two of them, Eben Etzebet, also up there. So we, we're quite fortunate with the team we have now. And what are you up to these days? I've got an import company. I import uh, a lot of stuff from, from Europe and, and, uh, and China. Uh, I'm a wholesaler, but I am also uh, do a lot of online online sales. I believe um, that's the way to go forward. Um, you know, South Africa is really picking up in that department. So it's going well and uh, it's new challenges. Okay, Narka, we're going to finish off with the trivia question. In 1994, Joel Stransky equaled the Springbok individual points record of 22 in one test. Who were the opponents that day? Do you know the answer, Narka? Was it England? So the answer is, in fact, Argentina. It was in Port Elizabeth, and it was Kitch Christie's first test match in charge of the Springboks. Okay, I remember that one, yeah. <laughs> Naka, let me say, it was lovely having you on Front Row Rugby today. An absolute pleasure, and I hope that we can have you on again in the future. Oh, thank you so much, and thanks for the invite. It was really nice talking to you guys. Thank you so much for watching. We're back to our usual format here on Front Row Rugby, where I interview Springbok heroes from the past. Last time, we had Crano Otto on the show, the 1995 Rugby World Cup champion and 1998 Tri-Nations winner. You can go and watch that video. It's appearing on your screen right now. Next time, we'll have Stefan Tablanche here.